In the previous video, I discussed Need for Speed Underground, a groundbreaking arcade racing game which pretty much put car customization in the spotlight and changed the Need for Speed series forever. This time, we're taking a look at the game's sequel, the game that introduced open world mechanics to the franchise. My name is Rebecca, and this is Need for Speed Underground 2, a retrospective. Before even finishing work on the first Underground, it was clear to EA and Black Box that they struck gold with this new formula. So they started working on the follow-up towards the end of its predecessor's development in July of 2003. The team initially intended for many of the features in this game to be part of the original Underground, but they were removed for what was likely time constraints. So with a bunch of unused ideas and a game that was sure to make hella money, the next step was obvious. And since one of the main complaints about its predecessor was the small variety of tracks and the lack of free roaming, another major improvement was clear to the developers. An open world. Need for Speed Underground 2 takes place in Bayview, and this time around the city is actually based on more than just generic American city. Bayview is heavily influenced by Los Angeles, and to a lesser extent San Francisco. The city is split into four main areas, each with its distinct vibe, and possibly geometric shape and color, but the colored shapes on the signs in the game always confused me. The first area you have access to is the city core, a big downtown area with a massive stadium where about half of the drift events take place, a bright and colorful casino plaza with a huge and really pretty fountain in the middle that's also a pain to drive through but when you do manage to do it without crashing, you'll feel amazing, and a Mexican neighborhood along with some more generic downtowny stuff. Next up is Beacon Hill, which is part San Francisco with its hills and row houses, and part Beverly Hills. Most notably, an area heavily based on LA's famous Two Rodeo Drive. A cruise ship is located off the west coast here, and there's a nice park area on the eastern side of the borough, the Brad Lawless Park, named in memory of a boy who was in some way connected to the team and sadly passed away during the development of the game. Probably the most memorable thing about the park is the greenhouse, which ends in a jump over occasionally, hopefully, traffic. To the north of Beacon Hill is Jackson Heights, largely based on the Hollywood Hills. Here you find lots of mansions, the Nod Griffith Observatory, what is likely supposed to be the back part of the Bayview sign, although without the sign being visible from here, and loads and loads of bendy roads. <laughs> This borough more than likely provided the inspiration for the canyons in Need for Speed Carbon. As one member of the now deleted EA forums pointed out, one of the canyon tracks in that game is almost identical to the easternmost portion of Jackson Heights. You either love this area for how bendy the roads are and for the downhill drifts that take place here, or you hate it for how long it takes to go anywhere when you're here. And I won't tell you which one is my opinion. The last area to be unlocked is Coal Harbor. Located to the south of City Core, it's split into two for no real reason, seeing as it's the smallest area in the game. This feeds into the pacing issues this game has, but we'll talk about those later. Coal Harbor is an industrial area as its name implies. Here you'll find factories, a train yard, and a nuclear power plant. And you can race inside of a dry dock chip. It's an aesthetically fairly cool area, but again, it's the smallest area in the game, and at first you only get access to half of it. Other than the main boroughs, Bayview has a fairly big highway system with a really nice pattern on the walls actually, which serves as a way to travel between City Core, Beacon Hill, and Coal Harbor, although most of it goes in a loop around the City Core. There is also an airport located near Coal Harbor that's only linked to the city via the previously mentioned highway system, and racing happens on the runway sometimes. For some reason. The story picks up where the previous game left. The storyline in this game is presented through static images in the form of comic book panels with some music and narration, and the occasional in-engine footage. A step down from Underground 1's fully animated CG cutscenes, but kind of understandable considering how big the game was in scope and the fact that it was in production at the same time as Most Wanted, which is where most of the resources probably went. You play as the same unnamed protagonist as in the prequel, who, after defeating Eddie and his crew, is the uncontested street racing champion of Olympic City. While driving around and totally not bathe you with a CPF filter dude, trust me, Caleb, this game's villain and leader of the rates, invites the protagonist to join his gang. 
he refuses, and on his way to a party, he gets T-boned by Caleb, and his car gets taken out of commission. Six months later, he's on a plane to Bayview where Samantha's friend Rachel is waiting for him and lends him her car, a souped-up Nissan 350Z, which she apparently just left at the airport before mailing the keys all the way to Texas? I'm only realizing how ridiculous this all is as I'm writing the script. Anyway, you're only supposed to use her car to drive to the car lot and buy your own. But you can drive around and participate in a few races, which give you some extra money to start the game with. Money is pretty tight at the beginning, and while we won't need it, because the game is designed to be beatable while only doing the required races, it's good to have it. Rachel won't like it if you race in her car, though. But the only consequence is an angry text from her. After you pick a car from the handful of starters, which actually differ between the American and European versions, you go and meet with Rachel again at her garage. Here she tells you about the Bayview racing scene and introduces you to Tommy, the mechanic in this game who doesn't actually ever appear outside of the scene, I think. This is also the last bit of story until almost the very end of the game. Underground 1 was light on story 2, but at least it had some stuff going on between the beginning and the end. Underground 2 is set up in stages, and in each stage, except for stage 0 when you drive Rachel's car, you get a checklist of things you need to do to advance. There are 5 stages excluding the intro, and in each of them you have to win a certain number of regular races and URLs, more on that later, and after stage 1 you also get locked into sponsorship contracts which require you to win special sponsor races with bigger payouts as well as get featured on DVD covers, which you get by modifying your car to reach higher visual ratings. And yes, the game uses real-life sponsors, which I'll talk about in its own separate section because it's one of the main complaints I have with this game. Anyway, after you've fulfilled all of your contracts, you race Nikki, Caleb's girlfriend, see a pattern here? Who after losing, gets yelled at by her asshole boyfriend and decides to leave him and help you out instead. She doesn't actually help you out in any way whatsoever and only appears in two other cutscenes together with Rachel, basically just cheering you on. After that, you win a few other races, the last of which being against the Wraiths, and then race Caleb himself in a one-on-one -on -one boss race kind of deal. Caleb's race is a 10 minute long snorefest and by the end of the race I had a 20 second lead on the dude. You then get a cutscene of a still image of Rachel and Nikki celebrating your victory, followed by a first person cutscene of some roads being driven on and that's it. Story done! The gameplay in Underground 2 is pretty similar to the one in the first game, with some notable additions, the biggest one being, of course, the introduction of an open world. One of the main features of the open world are the shops, which you need to actually drive around and find in order to unlock the parts they sell. There are four kinds of shops in Bayview. Performance, body, graphics, and specialties, as well as the car lock. The shops can be found with help from their colored lights, and each type of shop has a different color. Pretty cool. Performance shops offer, completely expectedly, performance parts, which come in three tiers of packages, but can also now be purchased separately. This allows for the purchase of performance upgrades even when you can't afford an entire package, as well as purchasing parts from lower tiered packages. Because for whatever reason, buying the highest tier package doesn't actually bring your car up to speed, pun not intended, except when buying tires, nitros, or turbo. Instead, in order to actually max out your car, you'll often need to scroll through the parts list and buy everything that doesn't make the game tell you that you're about to get a part weaker than what you already have. In the case of the weight reduction kit, every package has completely unique changes requiring to buy all of the packages to get a full effect. It's a strange system that requires way too many button presses and confirmation pop-ups, and if you're not a car buff, you often won't be able to tell which parts to proceed which, so you'll have to go through every part every time and see if the pop-up tells you that the part is worse than the one you already have installed. To make matters worse, rather than offering you multiple branded packages and just mentioning the brands on the side of the screen like the original Underground, Underground 2 straight up shows you another pop-up for each package, making you choose what brand every individual part in the package should be. This affects literally nothing and is just there to sell you on brands. Body shops sell body mods for your car. 
Here you can find stuff like bumpers, spoilers, rims and headlights later on, even allowing you to convert your trunk and body kit into carbon fiber. There are more parts available here than in Underground 1, and there are now multiple tiers of parts like mirrors, lights and exhaust tips. In Underground 1 there is just like one of them. But there isn't much else to say here, so let's move on. The graphics shop allows you to repaint your car, as well as individual parts like spoilers, mirrors and even engine accents. As well as apply decals and vinyls to it. As an addendum to the last video, vinyls in Underground 1 and 2 work by allowing you to apply 4 layers of them, chosen from multiple different categories. I also forgot to talk about decals in the previous video, and they again work identically here. You can apply them to your windows and fenders and their brand logos, again. Last but not least, the specialty shop. Here you can customize your dashboard ga gauges? Gauges? Okay, I looked it up and both are correct, but I'll just call them gauges. Add neons, which you can now also add to the trunk and engine, and a cut feature allowed you to add them to the car interior. Modify your nitrous purge system, add hydraulics, spinners, trunk audio setups, and even custom doors and split hoods. A lot of the stuff here is very tacky, but you need to use it to reach the maximum visual rating. While in the original underground, by the end you'd have a car that you actually like looking at. Here you're forced to install stuff that you probably hate, like carbon trunks and spinners, and after I did all the DVD photo shoots, I downgraded my car back to around an 8.5 star rating, just because I absolutely hated the way it looked. Also, there is the car lot! You buy cars there! Moving on from the shops, the main part of the game is... well, the racing. Unlike the first underground, you now have to drive to highlighted spots around the city to start racing, and there are now optional races as well. Some of the optional races are even hidden from the map, and you have to listen to the occasional calls from other races that give you hints about the location of these races. Sometimes they glitch out and they're wrong. Or just find them yourself while driving around. These hidden races pay out more than just the regular ones, uh, although not as much as the sponsored races, so if you're low on cash, definitely be on the lookout for these. The only problem with this new system is that you have to drive to the race starting points to start them. There's no fast travel system and the city is pretty big, so driving from one end to the other takes a while. This wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for Jackson Heights road layout, which basically makes it impossible to get anywhere quickly because of the massive hill it's built on. Although this is thankfully addressed in the next game, this means that if you're anything like me, you'll be avoiding races in the northern half of Jackson Heights like the plague. Which is sad, because that's where all the coolest downhill drifts take place. Speaking of downhill drifts, new and returning race modes! I know I already mentioned downhill drifts, but they're somehow the race type that needs the most context to explain properly. So let's start with the returning modes instead. Circuit and sprint are literally the same as in the previous game, so there isn't anything to talk about here. Drag races are also unchanged gameplay-wise, but now exist in a weird place where they're technically supposed to take place on the free roam map, but they don't. Let me explain. There are three drag courses in the game. One takes place on the Bayview Bridge, which links Beacon Hill and City Core. Another one takes place in the train yard in Cole Harbor. Except they don't. The game implies that these races take place in the game world with the course maps you receive when activating them, but the actual courses themselves look nothing like the locations they're supposed to take place in. The last one takes place on an airport runway, but you don't actually go there in free roam, so that one gets a pass for now. Time trials are also back, and you unlock them by earning reputation points. The only thing they give you this time around is money. Reputation points are earned by coming ahead of the second place, and the further ahead you finish, the more points you earn. After this, Rachel calls you to say that you're going to be featured on a magazine cover, and you need to go to a certain location on the map. Once you get there, you get a text telling you where the photographer is, and for some reason they're always late and need to catch a plane or something. It's convoluted and weird, but hey, money! Last but not least, Drifts. These events received the most changes, mostly because of the way they were received in the first Underground. According to Justin Weeb, Weeb, uh, god damn it, associate producer on Underground 2 in a 2004 interview with GameSpy, Many players expressed concern that as they were drifting around the track, the opponent's score would generally increment up based closely to what the player was scoring. The largest issue was that once the player crossed the finish line, the opponent's score would perform one last updated move which meant the user felt like they had no control over whether they won or lost the race. To solve this, the team added AI racers to drift events, earning points in real time. The player can collide with these racers, which is supposed to be a bad thing, but they often end up pushing you and giving you more points or acting as a cushion between you and the wall. Now, onto the new race modes. The big one is the Underground Racing League, or URL. 
I say big both as important, but also like big. These races are basically circuits, except they take place on enclosed racetracks with larger numbers of opponents. There are two maps for these races, the Bayview Speedway and the Airport. The Speedway is pretty boring, and the Airport is also pretty boring, but planes land on the runway that you're racing on. The, the races are just really boring. By the end of the game, they have way too many laps, and starting around mid-game, they usually are tournaments, made up of two or even three races, making it even more of a chore to get through them. These races make up a significant portion of the game and there are only 11 distinct courses in total, meaning that in the last stage of the game alone you go through pretty much every one of them. They're also very easy except for a short time towards the very end when they get hard for a couple of races, and then right before you race Caleb they get super easy again. In my opinion, adding in these races was the worst design decision the developers made with this game. They just feel like filler and artificially extend the game past the point where it's interesting. The only good thing about URLs is that up until mid stage 5, each uh, one URL event unlocks a new car. Next up, less negativity. Street Cross is a new race mode that pits you against three opponents in an enclosed track? Hey, wait a second, these are the Underground 1 drift tracks. Anyway, other than this and the fact that I always end up pronouncing it Street X, these races are pretty fun. Nitrous is disabled, and it's easy to lose if you make mistakes or have a car that can't corner too well. Oh, I almost forgot! Downhill drifts! Here you, um, you drift downhill. The other opponents are gone, and you get a bunch of target times for each place, as well as a percentage indicator for the overall event. The main cool thing is that you're driving on the race map, which means, more or less, overworld drifting. They all take place in Jackson Heights, and they involve avoiding traffic and sometimes using shortcuts to cheese them and get massive amounts of points. And finally, the last new race mode in Underground 2 is Outrun mode. No relation. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of this one either, the concept is completely fine. You don't start these races by going to a marker on the map, but instead drive around looking for other races free roaming in the city. Once close enough behind them, you can press the action button to start a race with them. That's kinda how um, races in Midnight Club work. Your goal here is to get 300 meters ahead of your opponent by any means necessary. If your opponent takes the lead, they have to do the same thing to you. Again, nothing wrong with this conceptually, but the execution is uh, less than stellar. The rubber banding AI unmodified from Underground 1 makes this a huge pain since the opponent will stick really close to you unless they mess up and crash, which I mean it well, but not consistently. Or you totally cheese the race and do something like a handbrake 180 turn as soon as you have the lead. Oh, um, there's also actually uh, one more uh, race type. It's actually just a circuit, but it's called an SUV race. Other new and relatively minor features are the weather system, the time cycle, and the free roam pickups. Calling it a weather system is kind of overselling it since all it does is make it sometimes rain, but it does affect the car handling, which is cool. The time cycle basically means that instead of the game being stuck permanently at midnight, you get a full dusk to dawn night. Sure, it loops back to dusk once it gets to dawn, but it's still a welcome change. And finally, pickups. There's two types of them, cash and tips. The cash pickups give you a small amount of money, at least in the context of the game, and the tips give you an even smaller amount of money, but also tell you various things about the game. These range from explaining game mechanics to hinting in the locations of various shops, and they're often completely useless. While it seems that all of the cars from Underground 1 were set to return because they have folders in the game data, not all did. The Acura Integra, Dodge Neon, and Honda S2000 were removed, and the Mitsubishi Lancer and Subaru Impreza RS were re replaced by newer and more powerful versions, the Lancer Evolution and the Impreza WRX. In addition to most of Underground 1's roster returning, the sequel introduces a bunch of new cars from the legendary Corolla AE86 to the Mitsubishi 3000 GT, Audi TT, and A3 to the Ford Mustang. Oh, and uh, SUVs. Uh, SUVs. Apparently, when Black Box started working on Underground 2, they noticed that the tuner scene had changed and now it included muscle cars and SUVs. I don't disagree per se, because I was 7 when this game came out and I have no idea what was going on at the time. But man, SUVs are boring! The three SUVs in this game are the Cadillac Escalade, the Hummer H2, and the Lincoln Navigator. 
You unlock all of these in stage 2 and they're more or less identical gameplay wise. They're sluggish and they handle poorly and although when upgraded they theoretically have a higher top speed than any regular cars and their handling is much improved, they still can hold a candle to the tuners. In fact, when driving an SUV you can only race against other SUVs, presumably so you don't get curb stomped immediately. The game was apparently going to feature more SUVs, like a Ford Bronco, which was presumably a starter, and a Porsche Cayenne, which was likely going to be unlocked later on. This would have actually given SUV races a proper sense of progression. On top of there only being a handful of SUVs, there's also the fact that they don't have all the visual parts available, further limiting their variety. Otherwise, the cars handle very similarly to how they did in the first Underground. The physics engine just makes them feel good to drive, and the addition of the dyno and deeper performance tuning makes it even better. For example, from the performance tuning menu, you can change properties such as steering, making cars like the Mitsubishi Eclipse actually fun to drive since its stock configuration severely understeers. There's also a test track you can use from this menu, which is basically a URL track on which you can set lap times and test your configuration. Another addition to the driving mechanics is the new Nitro system. While in the original you only had one tank per race, here you can recharge your meter by performing various stunts. The system is pretty similar to the style point system in Underground 1, which I forgot to talk about in the previous video. Okay, so in Underground 1, style points were awarded for stuff like jumps, near misses, and power slides, and they unlocked vinyls and special cars for quick race. In Underground 2, vinyls are unlocked through the normal progression system, and the points awarded instead fill up your nitrous gauge. The gauge takes about a thousand points to refill, but wait, there's more. If you fill up your gauge, the race breaker system kicks in and allows you to overfill it, essentially giving you twice the amount you start the race with. The race breaker nitrous is more powerful than the first meter. The last thing I'm gonna talk about before going into politics is the presentation of Underground 2. There isn't a lot to talk about here. The music is more of the same, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You get early 2000s techno, rap, and metal, so there's bound to be something there that you're gonna enjoy. Unless you just hated 2000s, I guess. <laughs> On the visual side, sometimes Underground 2 looks worse than its predecessor and the ground textures at the beginning of the game when you're locked in place on a low-res parking spot always look jarring to me when I start a new game. This is offset by a lot of factors though. I mean, first of all, the game world is massive for a game made in 2004, whereas the original Underground only had a handful of tracks and the style of the game is taken up to 11. More neons, more bright lights, yeah! So I mentioned earlier that I talk about some things at the end of the video. A major issue I have with this game is that the progression is built around sponsorship contracts with brands, presented without any hint of irony or parody. Starting with stage 2, you get a selection of real-world brands to show, in exchange for a cash bonus, a free car, and some milestones to achieve. You're forced to pick one of the three brands to progress, and this comes in addition to the game also forcing you to pick the brand of the performance parts, again with no real point except product placement. There are some more places, such as like the trunk audio parts and rims, but here you're also given the option to ignore the branded parts and get admittedly uglier original Underground 2 parts. This of course comes in addition to the environmental product placement like billboards and a very prominent Burger King which not only acts as a shortcut but also gets mentioned by some tips in the game by name. But my issues don't really stop here. I know this is gonna be controversial since it's a big part of car culture, but I don't necessarily see the need for anything to be branded. This includes the cars. Okay, hear me out here. Underground 2 is an arcade racer, which means it's implicitly unrealistic, and it takes place in a fictional city that only takes cues from real life cities. So why do people feel the need to see real car and part names? People will probably say that it's because of their attachment to certain car manufacturers and models, but those can be represented without product placement. Take for example Rockstar Games. The first two entries in the Midnight Club series didn't use real car names, and while it's true that they didn't sell very well, I'd argue it had more to do with the series gameplay than its lack of realistic car brands. Another example from the publisher is the Grand Theft Auto series, which as a parody of American culture and arguably capitalism, sometimes, it features entirely fictional brand names based, however, on real-life ones. I think the Need for Speed series would not only not suffer from the removal of real branding and product placement, but it would gain artistic integrity that is otherwise diminished by EA's, uh, 
affinity for product placement. Moreover, I feel that the practice serves to push corporate interests beyond simple advertising. Product placement in art serves to normalize the idea that brands are an intrinsic part of life, to the point where it becomes almost invisible when it shows up in movies, TV shows, and even video games, and its absence is noticed, often to the point where, for example in some video games like GTA, real branded vehicles and sometimes even random scenery are modded in, replacing the satirical versions already in the game. I think this highlights the grasp that capitalism has on pop culture and it's kinda scary. So hey, sorry for ending the video on such a downer note, but I do think talking about this kind of stuff is actually super important. Overall though, Underground 2 is a great game, albeit an evolutionary step and not revolutionary like its predecessor. It built upon the solid foundations of Underground 1 while improving it in almost every way. It does have its flaws, but for a game that was created basically as a stopgap between Underground and Most Wanted, it's excellent. It was one of my favorite games growing up, and while I kinda lost my rose-tinted view of it since finally completing it, I can still warmly recommend it. Just keep in mind that it's a product of capitalism, and while I do truly believe that the developers wanted to make a fun game that people would buy and enjoy, that was not the only intention of the publisher. As stated in my last video, I recommend playing this game with 13 AG's widescreen patch and a controller. Oh, and also, I recorded about half of this video in Linux, which is really cool. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe because I'll have more of these coming out, uh, not soon, but eventually. The next video is gonna be either about Apes Odyssey or The Longest Journey, which are both hella political games, and after those I'll probably be back to do Most Wanted and Carbon. This was Need for Speed Underground 2, a retrospective, and I'll see you next time.